This is Jend. He makes house music. So we are doing this because they wrote me earlier this year. Hey Jesse, I hope you're doing well. My name is Nico. I've been a big fan of your work for quite some time. Your video has been really helpful in my journey, helping me reach over 1.6 million monthly listeners. Oh, that's 2 million now. As you can see, they have a bunch of songs with a lot of streams and they've been doing this very well for quite a while. So he actually wrote a blueprint on how artists can do it and he's going to tell you all about it i interviewed him we talked a lot about different strategies a lot of facebook ad discussion in here uh, a lot of artist playlist discussion here that one of the things i want to emphasize you could be like oh i don't do house music everything he's talking about in here other artists could do it i think if anything it's a real testament to how good he is at the style of music because this style of music is actually pretty that he makes is pretty hard to break it's a crowded crowded genre so he wrote me asking me if i wanted to have a conversation i of course did because i always want to talk to artists who are doing well with our methods of releasing and as you'll hear he's used a lot of the methods we prescribe on the channel some of his own and he has this whole other community and blueprint that he's selling and i thought it, this would be interesting for you guys. I always want to make sure you're getting the best information out there. So we had a nice, I think, very thoughtful and interesting conversation. So enjoy it. Nico, so nice to have you here today. Give the audience like one or two minutes about your journey so they could understand how you got to where you are today. Sure. Hey, Jesse, by the way, thanks for giving me the, the platform. So first of all, basically, I started making music when I was around 15, just with the friends. I downloaded FL Studio and just played around with it. Really liked it, so I got hooked and just kept doing it as a hobby. Didn't really think much of it, just played video games and made music on the side during school. And it all developed during the last years of my school when I was kind of running e-commerce businesses and helping other businesses with digital marketing. I really got into that field. And I always told myself, I love music. I'd love to do music full time one day, but the chances of this actually happening are so low that I probably focus on school, focus on the business thing and, and then see how things go, but always kind of have it on the side. And basically once I finished school and I was doing, I was in my civil service, which is a mandatory nine months in Austria, where you have to either do military or do certain jobs for, for the country. Hmm. And there I basically stopped all the business things I was doing. I was just focusing on, on that and coming home in the evenings and making more music and really getting more into it. And for me, it was a click then that I figured it out. What if I use the digital marketing thing, the knowledge that I learned with past years for my music. And I really kind of started to think of the music as more of a business instead of just like a side hobby. And I figured out a plan how to release my music in the last next year. And that was around three years ago now. And since then, I've just kind of been releasing over and over again, kind of fine tuning my promotional strategies, doing it almost all independently. And yeah, now I'm kind of there living off my music. I just moved to Barcelona and yeah, I learned a lot over the process and I I'd love to share the information with, with other artists. Nice. Yeah. I love that you're sharing it and we'll get into that as well. So let's talk about what starts to change. There's like always that point where you know, you're making some progress, but then the progress really starts to happen. Talk to us about what you started to tweak to get that to happen. Basically, I started with just uploading some songs on SoundCloud. Obviously there, nothing happened. I had got a few songs, a few streams from my friends and my family listening. I then started releasing on Spotify. It was a big step back then, but the first few tracks I didn't promote at all. I just uploaded them and just kind of had it there. Maybe one Instagram post, say it's out now, but that was around it. And then, yeah, when I said that I kind of had that clicked kind of take it all a little more serious. I then started releasing first in the P and then every few, four to six weeks, a single. I've started with playlist promotion, I, I, Facebook ads, TikTok. I've tried YouTube. I've tried a bunch of different things. In the end, I do a combination of Facebook ads, especially Instagram. And I know it's a bit of a controversial <laughs> topic. It's that with uh, my own playlists, which I found extremely useful, mixed with consistency and basically joy of doing it in a routinely matter and doing it long term and doing it consistently so let's zoom in on that playlist talk to us about your strategy so basically this was another big um step where like i really saw a bunch of progress is when i didn't only pitch my songs to different playlists but i made my own playlists and started promoting those as well instead of just my own songs and i figured that it's much easier to promote a playlist than to promote a song and on instagram if you have meta ads running, they're also a lot cheaper 
And if you have songs in there, you get cheap streams basically. And not only that, but you give Spotify a lot of data on what the listeners also listen to, because you can really pick which songs are next to your tracks. And the more people you have then listening to your playlist, the more data Spotify gets to then use to promote you later on. That's the first part of it. But the second part is actually becoming a, a playlist curator, which is not exactly making music. If you're already making music, I think listening to some music for, I don't know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes every day is not a hard task. And for that, you get paid between a dollar and $6 per song to listen to and give feedback on. You don't have to accept the track. So, so you, uh, w w let's back that up though. That's through Submit Hub or who's, who, who are you getting paid by? Yeah, Submit Hub, Playlist Push, Sound Campaign, Groover. There's a bunch of platforms. And once your playlist gets over 500 or 1,000 um, likes, it depends on what platform, you can then apply to them and become a curator yourself. With the money you get then from, from the submissions, you can then put it back into the promotion and kind of have an evergreen promotion thing, which is growing your playlist, growing your tracks, and your, your catalog, as well as giving Spotify really valuable data on where your music fits in, in the big map of genres and artists. So let's talk about, so you make house music. Are you titling these playlists, anything that's like genre specific, location specific? Yeah, super simple. For my more chill tracks, I have house hits 2024, and I just update the year every year. And I have tech house 2024, and then one that's called Chill Beach Club. Interesting. So do you find that a lot of this comes from search or do you find a lot of this is that like the ads drive most of it? It's most of it is the ads as well as you have some playlists like daily playlists where basically instead of paying you, people have to follow the playlist and like a track or follow you on Spotify to submit the track to you. And that's also a great way to kind of keep your playlist growing. Yeah. Most of the traffic comes from the ads, especially in the beginning. Once your playlists get 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 likes, then they'll start um, popping up on search more often. You'll get more organic views as well. I mean, it depends. If you're in a very small niche, I feel like you need to be, you don't need to be that big of a playlist to start popping up. Yeah. I found the same thing that like some of the people I consult with when they're making a really burgeoning genre or something that just really hasn't gotten a lot of people competing. If you find that genre early it's shocking how fast it'll come up on spotify i mean it is the funny thing that since spotify makes up so many genre names that they then make their algorithmic playlist and will knock you down if they decide to take the name but it's shocking how quick that can be a big fix and i've seen a lot of artists that be a lot of what they've gotten a lot of leverage from for sure i know a little thing i found is like how you can kickstart a playlist let's say you have a song that going really viral on Instagram or on TikTok, and it's not out yet, you can name your playlist after the title and put similar music into it. Obviously, it only makes sense if that's similar to your, your genre, but that can drive a lot of traffic as well, because people are already looking it up on Spotify, they can't find it, and then they check out the playlist. But it's not the best type of audience, it's not the best people to your playlist. Yeah, that's why I like ads, because you have an ad that clearly says, hey, you're looking for house music, you're looking for rock music of 2024, check out this playlist. Super simple ad clips, super simple ad creatives, and they get the point across. And when the people get to the playlist, they listen to, to big parts of it. And if your music is in there, it's indirect way of kind of putting in front of the right people. So a lot of people, when they think about this strategy, like one, some people get in the competitive mindset that they're like, oh, I'm promoting these other artists for free. And they feel like it's a zero sum game. Other people are like, oh, where do I put myself in this playlist? What do you see there? What, what, what has worked for you? And for the first point, I think it's a great thing that you're helping other artists. You can help other small artists and the people who submit the music to you on the platforms, like some hit up and stuff, like they'll have good music, you know, and they're often like often it's, I get amazing, amazing tracks and I check them out and they have like a thousand other listeners or something. I'm like, how is this possible? You know, the record I listen to the most right now, they have 4,000 monthly listeners. Mm -hmm. I totally know yes. what you mean, but I listen to music all day long. And I most, I, I listen to only music usually that's been made in this last six months because I'm constantly listening to new stuff. And I find that too. A lot of people are like, oh, it's all trash at the bottom. And I'm like, that's not the case. There's a lot of people who are making great stuff that have not been found yet. 100%. There's so much great music out and so many like amazing artists that are undiscovered. And yeah, it's just, a lack of information or a lack of 
plan for a lot of artists and a lot of misconceptions that are out there. You know, there's a lot of bullshit out there in the music industry. I, I, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's another reason why like, I want to share it because I almost feel guilty that it's working so well for me, for my own music. Mm -hmm. So many people have no clue how to do it. And what I do is really not rocket science. It's something that like could be taught in a high school class within a week. Let's go back one second. So where are you putting your music in these playlists? Basically, I put a track in the first three probably number two or number three, then maybe five spots down another track, five spots down another track. Like it's just kind of that it doesn't seem yeah. too obvious that the playlist is from you. At this point I have, my catalog is over 60 songs. So my playlists are pretty packed with my tracks, but if you're starting out and you have three tracks, five tracks, 10 tracks, then put them all into your playlist and just kind of distribute them evenly that it doesn't sound, it doesn't seem too obvious that it's from you. I've seen it all the time. And it, like the funny thing is the playlist User playlist I listen to the most and find the most music on. This is the same thing they're doing. And I'm convinced it's this artist management makes it. I don't really care. I like that artist. I listen through. If I've gotten sick of the song, I skip it. But I find great new music from that playlist all the time. So let's talk about your educational offering. You have put out a guide for artists on how you did this, which I think is really great because I wish more people shared the knowledge to so talk to us a little bit about that. So basically this whole thing started around a year ago when other artists and managers started approaching me and asking for promotional services, where I basically do the release campaign for the artists. I started doing that for a friend of mine, for example, from Luxembourg, Nosy, and my, my roommate, Paco. And the same strategy that I did, I just applied to them and it worked really well for almost every artist in all genres. And it kind of showed me, okay, it's not just like my music or my luck. It's like what I'm doing actually like kind of works. I've been doing this then for a few months and I realized like it's a lot of time that goes into it. Like every Thursday I'm up doing two, three campaigns. And if my own song comes in, it's a lot as well. And yeah, I'm one of my best friends, Robin. He's a very smart business minded person, had some great startups before this. And he basically came up with the idea that instead of doing this, every service and stuff, we sum it up into a package that's digestible and easy to read. And that took now eight months to develop because I really, I didn't want to have any bullshit. I really wanted to make it as concise as possible that you really only get the information you need and I don't overwhelm you because it is a lot, but in the few chapters that I have in there, I think it's something that you can read in two days and basically get the information. And then the idea behind this as well is then it's combined with a group that we have on, on WhatsApp and everybody who basically reads the book and has the knowledge can then share their results, share their journey, give, get feedback on tracks, on, on mastering, especially a community of independent artists to kind of share their information, share their, what they've learned and then go from there. Love it. Let's get back to your early days. How much are you putting into ads? What's your daily budget, monthly budget looking like? Yeah. So I started doing my civil service, which was making me a few hundred bucks a month. So I allocated, I tried to do a hundred to 200 euro per my release. Okay. So, and so that's every month, like what, what's, every four what's, to six weeks. Yeah. Got it. So around a month, but sometimes longer. And, and so for Americans, which are most of our audience, one to 200 euros is like 110, 120 to $240 in range. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's, I see here, it's about 10% difference. So it's about the same thing, really. So it's about the same um, thing. Yeah. And it's just uh, a general estimate, like it doesn't have to be a strict thing. And yeah, I started with that. And I generally think like any budget helps. I know it's hard to tell somebody spend hundreds of bucks in promotional thing if you don't know what, what you're doing, because it is an expensive thing and it's a risky thing. If you don't do the right stuff, your money can go to complete waste, which I've learned the hard way. And even with a hundred bucks, like you can really kickstart your track because it's really not about the streams you're getting from the ads. It's more about giving Spotify the data to trigger the algorithm later on. So yeah. when I spend my hundred bucks on the track, I'll spend a third of it or more on the first day to really, really? try out a bunch of different ads the first day of different clips to different target audiences. Okay. So, so, so let's, let's get granular though. So when you say different clips, what, what are the differences in the clips? For my ad creators, which is the video that people actually see on Instagram, I use most cases, stock footages or some pictures I have from my camera roll, like filming out of, outside an airplane or outside a car or filming the sunset, you know, and look online what I can find on, on websites, for example, as Pexels is a great one. 
Yeah. So for people who don't know, Pexels is a fa fair use stock footage site. It's great. You see it all the time in my videos, footage I've gotten from Pexels. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal user source site. For sure. And it's 100% free and you get great clips and just mainly using those, to be honest, and then putting them all into a Final Cut project and then kind of having a different clip, but the same format of video where you'll have this at uh, the video starting with the lyrics of my track. And then when the drop comes or uh, the main part or whatever comes, I have the album with the title and out now. That's pretty much it. That's what I've been doing for years now. I'm not great at video editing, but this is something that like even I can do, you know? So you're promoting the album, not the playlist with those. I mainly promote singles. So that's like where yeah. I mainly teach on. If you release an album, I would approach it a little bit differently. We can talk about this later on. But generally, I think that most people should release singles and then work into an EP or into an album, but definitely not start with an album and basically extend your, your tracks that you have for a longer time. It really helps you out. I've had some people ask me like, why not release every week or every two weeks if I have so much music? And it's just really, first of all, overwhelming yourself. You overwhelm the algorithm because you can only get into Discover Weekly with a track a month and release radar might extend to two weeks as well. So you're kind of cutting yourself short there. And it's really hard to find clips, edit everything. And ideally you would be doing organic promotion as well and put, making videos and posting on uh, Instagram too. So that's way too much. I've said it before, but I've become even more dug in on it is that around a month, if the song is really working, if it's really going to go, like if we're talking, it's going to go into the tens of millions and above the 30 day mark is really when your promotion further pushing on is really going to take it the rest of the way there. It's so crucial. hundred percent. And yeah, what I wanted to say is the first for Spotify is really the first 24 hours, 48 hours and the first week where your metrics kind of matter the most. And you really want to try and get every stream, every save, every playlist ad that you can get as possible. When you say that it matters the most, tell us what you've found here. Yeah. So basically I found that almost every track has a very similar lifespan. It kind of starts with the highest budget when you're spending the first day and you're promoting the most at a peak. And then it usually kind of goes down during the week. And then there's either a few options, either what, either it goes directly into Discover Weekly and into radio the first week, which is kind of rare, or it happens in two weeks and then it kind of grows. But overall, most start big and tailor down and have a long, long tail that goes over until a year or two. Of course, not when you have like a hundred monthly listeners and you get two streams a day, you know, that's not when you can yeah. take this data, but let's say you have 10,000 monthly listeners or above, that's how you can kind of see it going. And the higher, basically that peak in the beginning is the longer and better the long tail of your track is in my opinion. And investing yeah. into ads into your, on a release, once it's a month out or two months out has way less of an impact on the long-term performance of your track than when you put it in the very beginning. Yeah. It, it is interesting. So yeah, for, artists that are starting out obviously the peak does not happen and it happens when they get in a playlist or they yeah. get in some momentum from the algorithm and everything but then a bigger artist you're going to get that big splash on day one you're hoping to sustain it as much as possible it's the same thing i see now on youtube which is very funny which is youtube you could have a very soft open but at some point the algorithm will take it into a massive peak and the bigger that peak is like right now I just put out my directorial debut of a documentary and in the first eight hours, we had a thousand views on it. We're 45 hours out and we have 175,000 views on it. And literally though, the difference I think often is, is that the undiscovered thing until it gets pushed in that algorithm, what the algorithm will do. And so many people don't realize this is kind of everything. Yeah, it is really, for me, it was really everything. And yeah. most of my streams are that they all come from algorithmic playlists. That's why another thing I tell people is don't focus too much on editorials. They're great, but they're not as great as they look like with, they have millions of likes, but you won't even get that many streams and you're only there for a month and you have no control over it. And if you're independent and you don't have a uh, direct contact to Spotify or a distributor or something that does, it's like a lottery winning, like, uh, and getting in, like, it's very, very hard. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I do caution language around this is is that what we see over and over again is the artists who get 
on editorials get on more algorithmic playlists, which is why when people like some people say like, fuck editorial playlists. Now, like there's a one guy on TikTok who's like, I want to never be in an editorial playlist again. I'm like, that's fucking silly because when you look at the algorithmic playlists that are made, it's all the same songs that are in that. They're just narrowing those down because now we have a more granular place. For sure. No, they're still great. It's obviously yeah. it's still awesome when you get on the one. It happened to me once with 60 releases, <laughs> you know? Techno and house, I think, are the crowdedest genres for placements on players. So, like, up to trap, you're in the most competitive one. Another reason why I think it's good to kind of build your own assets with the playlists. And something I, I forgot to mention as well, that the great thing, if you have your own playlist, is you can do playlist trades as well with other curators. Like, instead of pitching your track either by email or a DM, Hey, listen to my track. I think it fits into your playlist, which almost never works. You can, you can write them. Hey, saw your playlist. I also run some playlists. These are the tracks I'm looking to promote. If you're willing to do a trade, send me, send me the ones you're, you're doing. And most playlist owners are also artists. Yeah. That's, um, I think at this point, it's, it's, it's a very funny thing of like, when people are like, there's no playlist stuff, I'm like, well, it's a lot, yeah. of our, our, a lot of artists and a lot of these genres. Some genres, that's not the case. It's just music fans or it's just music writers. But a lot of genres now, I'm like, like particularly dance music, I'm like, I-, I can't think of the last time I saw somebody who's not just an artist doing the playlist. For sure. And yeah, you have way more leverage like this, and it's way higher chances of you actually getting into playlists that benefit you long term. Playlisting is great, but... Yeah, as you also covered many times already, it can be a very dangerous thing. There's a lot of foul actors out there. Basically, getting on a wrong playlist, especially when you have when you're in the beginning and you have a small audience, it can really screw your data and kind of mess you up long term. So you really kind of want to avoid that. Yeah. So what we're basically saying here is that when you're going on Submit Hub and you're going on these playlists that. We'll just put anything on there. It's a funk track. Then the next thing's a dance track. The next thing's a pop track. That's going to screw your data up real yeah. bad if that's the only thing Or the you playlist have, is- service um, websites that promise you, hey, yeah. pitch you to playlists that have 100,000 likes overall and stuff like these are very untrustworthy. I'd stay away from those. Okay. I want to get back to your ad stuff because my audience never hears from me promoting anybody with ads, obviously, mm-hmm. since it's not my method of growth. So- hundred two hundred dollars you're doing mostly the first day yeah how this does how that change started. yeah yeah so yeah that's what i was gonna say is so walk us through the evolution of like how that goes and how you've changed strategy in that the strategy has always kind of been the same it's just been optimized now that i've figured out to use between five and ten different clips or different ad creatives i usually pick only one part of my track for all the ad for all the ads for all the ads yes I mean, I've also figured out what countries work the best. You have things like tier one and tier two countries. Tier one are the countries that have a higher Spotify payout. The others are the ones where like South American countries or an Asian stuff that have much less of a payout and are cheaper to target to though. And it's a combination of using both to kind of get the more cost-effective performance in this, in, in streams in countries like Brazil or Mexico and stuff that will then also trigger global algorithmic push. Yeah, it's a complex topic, but yeah. if you simplify it, it's I'm basically throwing the spaghetti against the wall and I'm seeing what sticks on the first day. And then every day after that, I'm checking my ads and everything that doesn't perform well. Let's say if it costs me anything above 40, 50 cents per cost per conversion to get somebody onto Spotify from Instagram, I turn it off. That way I start with a high budget spending a lot of my budget on the first day, but really tailoring that really quickly where I end up spending maybe 10 or 20 bucks a day in ads which will then give me more performance and clicks than the first day where I spent 10 times as much because it's just optimized all the way down to the specific video that works the best. So I narrowed down all my clips to maybe the two, three that work the best, or maybe one, and also the best target interests, which in my case are usually genres or, or other artists in, in the similar genre. Nice. One more thing with the, the playlist you're on. What is the range of monthly listeners when you're starting out? Are you doing bigger songs? I mean, the big thing with dance music these days is that, like it really is crazy. Is that like you know you have artists that have just monumentally huge monthly listens? W- what were you, was your focus at first with the playlist? Really, the focus was to kind of build this evergreen promotional thing because every time I release a track, I put my new track number one or number two. You know. The ads are already running to my playlist, which is giving Spotify um, data on 
day one, first, first hour, you know, and then, yeah, to get, basically teach Spotify where my music fits in. I really think that the Spotify algorithm is like a kind of have to imagine it's like a 3d map where you have different genres and you have rock here, you have electronic music here, you have hip hop here and you have your artists everywhere and then tracks as well. And they all kind of fit into different parts of that map. And the more Spotify knows where to place you into this map, the more it's able to promote your music to fans in the same area as you. So when people listen to a big artist or a small artist, it doesn't really matter. A lot of those streams are coupled with yours in the playlist. They will then put your music out to their fans. That's why in the playlist, I have a mix of smaller artists, of bigger artists. You do want to have the biggest tracks of that genre because that's what you're promoting. Usually I'm saying those are the best tech house songs of 2024. You want to put yeah. Fisher, you want to put David Gettin, whatever in there, you know? So people think it's a legit thing, but then you have the smaller artists that the people don't notice, like when they, when they just listen through, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's the thing is it's really interesting is that like, if you're doing promoting a playlist and you're, let's call it like dream pop shoegaze with synths or something, it's very obscure genre. You really do want to keep this obscure, but with your type of stuff, you do want to have that mix of like one, somebody's like, Oh, this is a banger. I've never heard. But two, here's the thing I was fucked up to at the club last week. And I love this song. I had the best time. I was grinding this person. We are having the great time of our lives for sure in the end the best scenario would be that you have a playlist that people like after seeing the ad and then play on the weekend to their friends yeah you know uh, that that is definitely the, the best case scenario is basically what i have with that one playlist i talk about is that either one you share it and say this is where i'm finding music or two you keep coming back i've been coming back to that one playlist for i think almost two years now so like that's a real ideal thing for that artist that's curating it mm -hmm. for sure Okay, let's shift gears a little. I feel like we've done a lot on that section of it. You're also working socials, obviously. Tell us about what your strategy is on socials. Personally, I'm a very shy person in front of the camera, and I don't really love social media. But obviously, as an artist, everybody knows it's part of the job description. So basically, I, now I just post things when I'm on vacation or when I play live. But it started out just doing a simple thing where I had... A picture of myself with a swipe over of something I'm working on. And I'm basically announcing something to come in two weeks, a month, a week after. I'm talking about Instagram mainly. Like I really focus on Instagram. I've tried TikTok, but I didn't have much success personally. It would be great if I did TikTok consistently over the past two years. I think things would be doing even better, but I just haven't been able to. And I think a lot of musicians are also kind of fed up with just being told to make TikToks every day. So my strategy doesn't involve any, any short form content. So far. Really? Yeah. Tell us what it then involves. Yeah. Basically you post on Instagram, you just kind of announce your tracks, show what you're working on, show what's happening in your life, just like a normal Instagram you'd have. And if you don't have content, you can always just preview tracks, show the cover art, make a preview of the, of one of the ads that you're going to be, uh, be running, you know, on the stock footage. And I usually do three, three posts, two to three posts leading up to a release. One of which is the only short form content I do, which is the out now post, which is a reel, which is with the video, with the lyrics or the, the build up or whatever, and then the cover and the caption is literally just the song title and out now with an emoji, simple wow. as that. And yeah, after that, I just kind of put on my stories the next few weeks, the track, you know, just from the sunset or from the sun or whatever with my track on there. And yeah, the great thing about having the ads running through Instagram is that people don't only get the video, but they also get your profile recommended, you know, and then the people who see your ad and like the ad often case go on your Instagram as well. Check out your profile, check out your, uh, the artist, um, behind the music. And yeah, a lot of them then end up following you and becoming long-term friends, which is a great side side product of having the ads. You know, they might not be engaged the same way as somebody who sees you live and lo loved you for, for a whole evening. You know, those people really stick more as fans. You know, I was starting out, I didn't have live gigs for the first two years. Even when I was DJing in Vienna, I was DJing in clubs where if I played my own music, like people wouldn't, would stop. Yeah. Music, yeah. You know? I, that's a, that's another tough thing of your genre is that yeah. like a lot of the time it's like your job is to DJ the bangers and you know, sure. yes, you could sneak in something obscure here or there, but boy, it better but get a clip pass. that's worth posting with an audience that yeah. really just wants to listen to a Katy Perry remix is <laughs> <laughs> not that new song. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it was tough. 
part of the reason why I went left Vienna and moved to Barcelona because there's more of a house scene here. Yeah, for people who don't know, Spain is just a massive dance scene. Yeah, right, yeah, and I've even said like a half an hour flight now from here. Oh wow, yeah, and that, and that for people who don't know, Ibiza is basically the dance destination of the world. I would say. Yeah, it has like all the clubs, and literally every day, Monday through Sunday, you have ten parties with the biggest, biggest artists. Anyways. So it's great to get inspiration there and kind of go, but yeah, you don't have to rely on playing live and getting footage like that. Also, I'm a producer with, that uses very minimal equipment. I really mm. just have a pair of speakers and my, my computer keyboard. I don't even have a, I have a MIDI keyboard, but I barely use it. Wow. I mean, it is so funny because I know so many people who, like, you, when you if you watch the podcast tape notes, it's so funny how often people are like, yeah, I didn't even have a keyboard with me when I wrote this. And you're just like, those are wild, wild chords to be doing without a keyboard. But, you know, I it's the same thing for me. It's like, I'm not the greatest songwriter or anything, but, like, I the only keyboard I've had for years is the tiniest <laughs> little thing. Yeah, that looks about what mine looks like. Yeah. It's a personal preference. It's extremely fun using equipment, but mm. that's just what I use. And so my performance videos, when people mm. give the tip, hey, film yourself performing your clip live or like in your room or something in your studio, it's kind of boring <laughs> to look at <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a click on my, on my laptop or just kind of bump my head to my track. I've tried it, but yeah, it's not really what I've worked for and seen for myself work. And what I tell artists as well, like if you're able to make content and you are a person that's very natural or you're able to teach yourself to become very natural at, at posting consistently and filming yourself and making creative videos and taking trends that are out there and kind of twisting it in your own way. That's fantastic. Why don't you give us an example of what you mean by that? So for example, most artists that blow up on TikTok post a lot of content. You know, you don't blow up after your 10th, 30th video. You do yeah. it after hundreds of videos. Um, yeah, the, it's the rarest thing. I mean, it's, it's very funny because the viewers of this, the members channel will be like, wait, you showed that guy last week that blew up after 20 videos. But I'm like, that is the, the rarest that thing is of all the things. That is the tick of the iceberg. I per personally find it very discouraging when I'm working a whole day on a, on a video, trying to fine tune everything, every cut that the retention rate is as best as possible. Because only that way, TikTok will, will actually push you out. You think of the caption, you think of the hashtags, you think of everything. And I overthink all this stuff way too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah same. Yeah, and then I post it and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's, I can do it maybe three or four times, but at, the, at some point I get discouraged pretty quickly with this stuff. And I love making music and I like promoting it, but I hate, I hate forcing myself doing these shorts that don't feel authentic to me at all. It's not how I see myself in, as an artist. And I generally think that if you're doing content and you're able to do it well, it's an amazing thing, but for most musicians, it's kind of like a side task that people tell you to do. And you think that like, you have to, you have to do it to kind of make it nowadays in the music scene. But even if you get one song to go really big and you get a bunch of views, one thing is to then get the views converted into Spotify streams, which is also very hard. But the other thing is then doing that consistently with your second track and then with your third track and with the fourth track. And then when you release an album to kind of keep the ball rolling and stay on the algorithm is, I think, a very challenging thing, which for me at least wasn't realistic. That's another reason why I'm here speaking this, because I just want to tell people that there are other ways than that. Yeah. No, that's what, what, why I'm having you here is like, I want my audience to hear all. I, the funny thing is, is this week too, I'm airing a discussion with two music marketers where they argue with me about Facebook ads and meta ads. Mm -hmm. And I want my audience to hear every story possible so they can do what's right for them. For sure. Yeah. And I'm not saying that my way is yeah. the best way or the only way. It's just what worked for me. And yeah. You know, as work for my roommate. Yeah. I, so I, I do, I want to get into two different things. One, how many hours are you spending on each of these songs that you're putting out? How much of music versus promotion hours? I spend more time on making the music. I since I make house music, I can make tracks pretty quickly. You know, mm -hmm. house is a pretty simple thing and have pretty much the same structure in most of my tracks. So I can make the base structure of a track in a few hours. But then I also do the mixing and the mastering myself because I've just been kind of too proud to give it over to somebody else. You can probably hear it that it's not professionally done. I thought you, your stuff sounded great. If you had told me it was professionally done, I would have believed it. I appreciate it. No, you clearly have a great ear. Thank you. Yeah, it's just listening in your car speakers, on your Bluetooth speakers, the headphones, and making sure it sounds good everywhere. That's pretty much all I do. 
I don't think that like my mastering is that great. It could definitely be much of improvement, but yeah, I generally think that like when you're trying to get your music out to, to listeners, your sound design doesn't have to be perfect. One thing that really helped me release more music and not overthink it is you're not making music for, for sound engineers, you know, you're making music for normal listeners who, who mm -hmm. can't tell the difference if your height is 10% louder or quieter. Yeah. I, I, I've often pointed the audience to Jeff Ellis, who's one of the best mixers in the games video on mixer brain versus Lister brain and that you put on Michael Jackson's Billy Jean. And if you just listen to it, it feels great. If you listen to it like a mixer, you're going, what fucking drugs were these people on? What are these levels? And you don't want to listen like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And yeah, I generally think that done is better than perfect. So you should just release your track when you're somewhat happy with it. Of course, if you have the budget and you know somebody who can do the mixing and mastering for you, that's great. But if you're spending a few hundred bucks on, on the mix and master of your tracks, I think you should definitely allocate at least the same amount of what the production of your track costed into the promotion. I mean, it's interesting for me because I see and talk to daily people who spend no money on their promotion and get millions of streams. They literally are just they have an intuition for the content. So it's like, it's always hard for me and like different genres too. Like if you're a indie band that sounds like always to get a great mix, you're going to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars. And you know, the promotion for that, I don't think needs to cost that much. Yeah. No, if you're spending that much, of course, I'm, I'm thinking in my mastering terms, yeah. like usually for, for an EDM track to be mastered, it's between a hundred and 500 bucks. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that that's the horrifying thing is some of the bigger mastering engineers and EDM are charging even more of that per track because they've gotten such great track records. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, I want to shift quick gear to, so you talked about that at one point you couldn't play your own stuff live, and but now you are. Yeah. Talk to me about where that changes. What does that look like? So basically my music started growing. It's doing better and better. And I basically had my friend call me and he's like, Hey, my friend, that was like, I think two years in or a year and a half in a good friend of mine called me and he's like, Hey, I have this friend. You don't know him, but he just played your track in the car and said he, he loved this guy's music and he makes events. Like he makes events in the city. I'll connect you with him. And yeah, guy came over, we came along well, and he gave me the first opportunity to start DJing somewhere, which was very lucky, you know, didn't do outreach, but then I kind of just did that for this event for a year or so. And I just did that once a month, once every one or two months. And yeah, it really only changed when also super randomly, I get a DM on Instagram from one of my followers sending me forward a, a story from a booking manager in Vienna asking for a DJ because somebody uh, got sick and he's looking for somebody quickly today. So I sent him the DM, got booked for that night. Uh, yeah. And this is the case for having your alerts on, on your Instagram DMs. Cause yeah. there's so many opportunities for that sure. are 24, 48 hours that like, I could not count the amount of times that I've tried to give people opportunities and they don't check their messages. For sure. No, it's very important to be active and respond to every message you get. Yeah. Um, there's really a lot of opportunities that come from there. Also collaborations and all kinds of things. But yeah, and basically that booking manager was happy with my performance and ended up kind of managing the music for six or seven different clubs and bars in the city. So it went from DJing once every two months to DJing three times a week like that. Wow. It was a fun time, but I kind of said it's enough. I was basically staying up to seven in the morning, three, four times in the week <laughs> and partying. So it was a fun time, but exhausting as well. And I realized like, I want to focus more on the music and this project and sharing this information. I don't blame you. I remember when I was 32 and it was like, this promoter was like, we love your DJ. We want you to do this every week. And I'm like, I do this two more weeks. I'm going to be dead <laughs> with how bad I feel after every time I do this. And I went, you know, you just, you're DJing. It just caught on a little too late in life for you to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, but even now, like I was, I was done with it. I really figured that like, I love DJing and I, and I love nightclubs and stuff, but three times a week is too much, <laughs> especially if I'm playing Katy Perry remixes and I have to drink enough so I can even withstand. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd take a lot of drinks for me to do that in 2024. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you start doing that and then you're peppering your tracks in. Like what 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 starts to change that you can actually play your music in your sets? 
the fact that I had a name for my music and I had my tracks out there basically made it much more easier for the booking manager to kind of give me these gigs because then all these um, clubs and stuff can then post it on their social media and stuff like say, hey, Friday, this DJ is playing. And yeah, the, the more I played, the more into like better clubs I got and the better nights where like house music was more, more the focus, I could then um, play my own tracks. Got yeah. it. Generally, my tracks are a bit more chill. I make house music, but it's more of a commercial chill direction. So most of my catalog isn't really suited for the club. So even if I wanted, I didn't. And as a DJ, it's a bit different as a DJ than if you're performing live as a singer or as a band. There you're playing your own music and entertain, like get your talent out. But for me as a DJ, I was booked to entertain the club and not so much for my name and my music. So my focus was to get people dancing. So I played a mix of my tracks mixed with popular stuff, super commercial, you know, stuff as well. But yeah, that's, that's why now in the future, and my, my goal from now on, like, is to go more into club direction with my releases. When you say move in more of a club direction with your releases, what does that mean? I mean, as I said, my, my tracks right now, they're kind of more chill house. They're meant more for your train ride or your commute from work. Not so much for the nightclub at 3 a.m. I've had some live gigs, but I personally want to, as a DJ, you know, want to get more into places like Ibiza and Barcelona and London, New York. You know, that's those are the... The big cities, those are obviously the big goals. And for that, I just need tracks that other DJs play as well. So then basically convince the bookings that I'm a good fit for that club. So that's just kind of my personal thing that I want to do right from, from now on. That changes a little bit of my approach with like how I make the music and how I promote it. Because now I'm also trying to have promoted to DJs directly, you know, to have them play it all over the world, not just my listeners. Up until now, it was just to get fans and people who enjoy the music and people who would find joy in listening to it. And that's where I found doing the playlists, and doing the ads and doing this consistently has worked really well for me. Yeah, it's kind of build a good base that I can work on now. And I would love for more artists to kind of approach it in a more strategic manner, you know, because I think a lot yeah. of artists would benefit greatly from it. Okay, so Nico, you've given and been so generous with so much information, but you have this whole guide. Tell people where they can go. Tell them about it. Give, give them the info if they want to go deeper with you. Thanks for letting me put this plug. Yeah, basically, I made this blueprint, and it's 130 pages of everything I learned, literally every step I do for my own releases and for my clients as an agency. It goes over the playlist. It goes over making music, how to finish them consistently. It goes over my whole process, and you can get it under independent.com. It's independent, like independent. But with gent, like my, my last man there. So I N D E P N J E N D dot com. Yes. And it's, all, it's linked in the description for all of yes, you as well. Yes. The blueprint is called the independent artist blueprint. And I really designed it to work for artists in all kinds of sizes. If you're starting out, if you've been doing it for years, if you have a million monthly listeners or if you have a hundred monthly listeners, if you're managing artists, I really designed it to work for all sizes and for all genres and. Yeah, with that comes access to the community I'm building right now. And I'm very proud to say that it's working much better than I thought it would. Like people are really engaged and we have weekly calls where we either go through the ad process or we go over somebody's release strategy and kind of give all each other feedback and help. And yeah, would love for people to join. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. This was such a fun talk. Yeah, really. No, thank you, Jesse, so much. Really appreciate it.